hello from the fall woods. It's really beautiful. Even with the wind and the cold that we've been having, the trees are still retaining a lot of their leaves. And it's very sunny, very windy, and um, the yellows are, are going on. And it's a beautiful fall day, and I think it's worth getting out and enjoying it before the cold creeps in on us faster than we ever wanted to. I am out in a mostly oak hickory woodland, which is a lot of the woodlands we have here in central Illinois. There's also quite a lot of pawpaw understory. They're all turning a beautiful bright yellow right now. And we've found some pretty cool trees so far on our hike. This time of year is a great time to work on your tree ID. But also we found another eruption year for a certain type of herbaceous plant in our woodlands. So I found a carpet of a very cool fern. This is a grape fern, which is actually in the adder's tongue family and has this single leaf, sometimes a couple leaves if there's multiple stems. They're very finely toothed and serrated and it has this really neat fruiting body. So this is where the spores are produced and this spore creating body um, is not quite open yet but these open and then the, the spores, especially on a windy day like today, would be spread across the forest floor and fortunately create quite a little colony. So we've got many plants here. See them all at the base of this beautiful oak. And they're all across the woodland floor here. Really neat spot and very cool thing to see. This spot is also particularly known for its sugar maples and for maple sugaring. So distilling the sap from a maple tree and turning it into maple syrup, which so, so many of us love. Uh, and this woodlands is full of sugar maples, which have really beautiful color this time of year in the oranges and yellows and reds. Um, so there's quite a lot of them. I'm gonna show you some of the unique identifying characteristics of sugar maples. So here is an example of what the leaves of a sugar maple look like. This is a sapling on the forest floor, so it's a perfect time to get a good look. There's kind of shallow lobes. They're very wide in comparison to how tall the leaves are. And they have, uh, if you think of a Canadian flag leaf, <laughs> this, is, this is it, I'm pretty sure. Sugar maple is their Canadian flag uh, leaf. So this time of year, it's, it's turned to a nice yellow, but it's got these tips that um, are kind of pointed as opposed to, to rounded. And really the shape compared to a red maple or a silver maple, which are other common maples around here, um, is much stouter and wider. And that's one way that I can always tell. And when it comes to their size, they're quite large. So here's a good example of the bark on an old maple. Oh my gosh, it is so windy. Cool, maybe I shouldn't be standing under this tree with dead branches. Eh, it's fine, right? Anyways, this is a old sugar maple. You can see, I shouldn't say it's old, it's, it's still pretty, pretty narrow, but it's got this kind of ridged flaky bark, but it also has in the places where old limbs have fallen, uh, kind of like an eye look to them. So if you look out across the forest, you can see that notching in the bark. That to me is a pretty telltale sign. It has a little bit of that stretching on the bark, um, but it's rather smooth when you look at it from afar. But all of those notches and kind of what I used to call as a kid eyes in the bark is kind of a telling characteristic of sugar maples. One of my favorite identification keys is burnt potato chips. And this is the bark of a black cherry, Prunus serotna, and it's quite tall. So you can't quite see the leaves, but the leaves turn a really nice yellow, red, pink this time of year. And 
this bark to me is the most telling. It's one of the darkest trees in the forest when it comes to the bark tone and the leaves are pretty characteristic as well. So here's an example of a black cherry, Prunus serotina leaf. Has a dark red petiole here with a red mid, mid vein and some toothing at the edges. So it's a serrated edge, serotina. And again, this yellowish orange color this time of year. Now here, it looks like there used to be a gall from a gall forming insect looks like it may or may not have escaped already, but a really great tree. Who doesn't love a pawpaw? Now this is an example of an understory pawpaw, very low to the ground, but still these huge tropical leaves. Look at that in comparison to my hand. It's massive. Kind of reminds me of a magnolia leaf. If you've seen some of our uh, native magnolias in the United States and it has this uh, paddle-like leaf structure, I would say, where it's thin at the base and then it gets wide at the tip with the tip, uh, pointy tip here. And of course this one does not have any fruits, uh, but we have seen some pretty big ones throughout the forest. Uh, this year just didn't seem like a very good year for fruit. And my guess is because if there's a late frost in the early spring and the flowers have already emerged and opened on the plant, those can get damaged by frost and then unlikely to get pollinated and produce fruit. So also some years are just really good for fruiting trees. Some years aren't so good for fruiting trees and um, they can't put out that much effort every single year. It'd be very exhausting to them. Another example of heavy fruiting from trees are in years called mast years. So mast years are when oaks particularly, but a lot of other different types of trees, hickories, whatever, uh, produced an abundance of fruit. So they had a really good year, they got everything they needed, and they produced a ton of fruit. This is really important for wildlife. It gives them a boost at the end of the year. They cache a lot of seeds. And then following that, they usually have a, a boost in the tree population as well because their seeds have very successfully spread throughout that mast year. Um, so it's beneficial for wildlife, it's beneficial for the trees, and um, it's just when they have a very good year, they produce a lot of fruit and nuts and um, spread their seeds more readily. So as an alternative to the white oak group, this is a member of the red oak group. And the way we can tell is these stipules, I believe they're called, or pointed hairs at the tip of the leaves. So they're not lobed and rounded like much in the white oak group. And this one in particular is a pin oak. It has these really glossy leaves, deep sinuses and lobes, and then these pointed tips at the tip of the leaf. So this is Quercus palustris. The buds on the post, on the pin oak, Quercus palustris, they're very hairy or fuzzy, I should say, like a whitish hair. I think we made a discovery that this actually may be cherry bark oak. So, so the buds do say that they are angular, which they are. They are angular, hairy, hairy but pin oak does not have hairy. Uh, that was the tell. Yeah. So We're out of the range cool. though, so that's weird. All right, so still a work in progress here, trying to figure out the closest possibility for this oak that we found on the ground. Now this is the one I said I thought was pin oak, but you know, could be a few different things. We are in a, a woodland where we have found multiple plants that may or may not be what we thought they were. All right, the jury's still out on this oak, but it, it could be a candidate for the black oak considering the range. 
but still not quite right. It does have the could reddish brown leaves. hairy hairy buds, but yeah, very could angular, be sun leaves. Very angular. To be determined. This is the best thing about trying to identify trees is that, especially here, we have such high diversity in oaks and hickories that sometimes they can be hard to differentiate. So you really have to use a key and know some of those botanical terms to try to figure them out. And that's part of the fun is trying to identify as many different characteristics as you can and just come up with your best guess because no one's grading you if you don't know, that's okay. Here is one of my absolute favorite trees of all time. This is a sycamore and I love the bark on a sycamore. It is telltale, can flakes off, sloughs up, and uh, the actual top of the bark here can photosynthesize. So it gives it a little extra energy during tough parts of the year, during the winter, when most of the foliage has already fallen off. Big for uh, floodplains, really beautiful. of a hackberry, you have this not quite even, it's an offset base that's connecting the leaf to the stem here. They're a little bit fuzzy, kind of sandpapery. The most interesting character for a hackberry, of course, though, is the bark. It's got this incredible topography all over the bark of the tree. Usually gets pretty covered with lichen. But yeah, this is basically a tiny little uh, micro refugia for different insects. And it's just a really neat pyramidal pattern, I guess, like these ridges is a really good characteristic of hackberries, Celtus occidentalis. Here's the very cool fruit of a native tree called Glidizia triacanthos, or the honey locust. And if you break these open, there's a sweet, sticky kind of fruit, I guess, inside, surrounding each seed. And it kind of smells like Fruit Loops. What else is cool about it? Oh yes, that is the coolest thing. By far the coolest thing about this fruit is that it has a megafaunal dispersal mechanism. So prehistoric times, the prehistoric megafauna of Illinois would eat these fruits and their seeds would be naturally scarified inside the stomach and digestive tract of the megafauna. So think giant sloths, uh, maybe mastodons, things like that. And they would break the seed coat uh, in the stomach of the animal and that would help them better germinate. So this here is the bark and some of the telltale characteristics about honey locust. It has this like flaky, very shield-like bark. And on the stem of uh, the trunk of the tree, it has these intense spines or thorns. Thorns are modified leaf tissue usually. And uh, these are to protect the tree from those megafauna that would eat the fruit that I was telling you about before. So it's kind of a protective mechanism to keep this tree from getting all of its precious parts eaten. So cool.